I just want to welcome everyone to the inaugural Gordon Bodek Lecture on Intergroup Conflict and Cooperation. And I want to thank the Bodek family for directing this gift to Urban Studies um, for this annual lecture, and also it funds an undergraduate prize for a student paper um, on the topic of interfaith and interracial relations. Um, and the goal of the, the program is really to enhance dialogue, inquiry, and public sensitivity about these issues. And for many years, Hanley Bodek, um, who's, who's with us here today up, up in the audience, um, taught a, a hands-on course for urban studies that focused on housing revitalization. And he approached urban studies about developing a plan uh, for the use of the gift that his father made to Penn. And Hanley and his sisters, Marnie Bodek Moss and, and uh, Jana Bodek Harris, entrusted us to shepherd this gift to Penn in a way that followed their father's wishes to create programs and materials that enhance interracial and interfaith relations. And uh, documentation of the lectures will create an archive that will make them available to, um, through our website, through the Urban Studies website, to a larger audience in, in the future. So we're very honored to have Douglas Massey as our first lecture, lecturer in the series, and Mark Stern, who's Urban Studies co-director and the Kenneth L. M. Prey Professor of Social Policy and History um, to introduce Professor Massey. Good afternoon. Uh, Doug Massey is the Henry G. Bryant Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs at Princeton University. In an age where the term public intellectual is often used to describe academics who hire their own press agent, Massey has honored that label by combining rigorous sci social scientific analysis with a willingness to speak to the, a broader audience. His book, American Apartheid, co-authored with Nancy Denton, detailed the persistent pattern of racial segregation in American cities and its implications for the life chances of African Americans. He wrote that at a time when the poverty literature was de-emphasizing the role of race in the reproduction of concentrated poverty. Beyond Smoke and Mirrors, which he co-authored with Jorge Durand, uh, it, uh, the book used uh, Douglas's innovative, Doug's innovative study of Mexican migration to explain the folly of border militarization as a ra rational policy choice. In Climbing Mount Laurel, the struggle for affordable housing and social mobility in an American suburb, Massey and his colleagues used an ingenious quasi-experimental design to again shoot down much of the conventional wisdom that has opposed vigorous efforts to create integrated community with affordable housing. Unfortunately, as with immigration, many of their conclusions seem to be ignored by politicians so far. It's really a pleasure to have Doug as our first Bodek lecturer. As far as I know, he's only made two mistakes in his life. The, it's pretty good. The first was to leave Penn to go to the University of Chicago, a mistake he corrected several years later. The second was to prefer orange and black to red and blue. There's no accounting for taste. Please join me in welcoming Doug Massey. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's always a pleasure to come back to Penn. I did spend 16 years of my life here on the faculty and uh, got to know and love uh, the great city of Philadelphia. I also spent a lot of time in the Bodeck Lounge over in Houston Hall <laughs> relaxing, so it's a pleasure to give the Bodeck, a Bodeck lecture here. Um, <clears throat> as Mark mentioned, I've done a lot of recent work on both uh, undocumented migration and residential segregation, and next year I'll be on sabbatical when I hope to do the 25th anniversary edition uh, update of American Apartheid. And uh, uh, at the same time, I want to try to at least get started on, if not write, a book on the political economy of undocumented migration and the train wreck that is American immigration policy. But my topic today is uh, learning from Mount Laurel. Um, as many of you may know, Mount Laurel is a suburb of Philadelphia, South Jersey, uh, about 12, 13 miles from Camden. Uh, that was the subject of a major court decision in New Jersey and a landmark piece of 
uh, of, uh, of jurisprudence in the, afford the, the field of affordable housing. Before I get to the specific cases of Mount Laurel, I just want to put everything into context. Um, there's been a tendency, especially since the election of Barack Obama as president, to say, oh, we're moving towards a race-blind society, and race doesn't matter so much anymore. But I think um, the, the political reaction against Obama and uh, the kind of ongoing Tea Party reaction against the changing demographics of the United States belie that statement. And certainly the evidence suggests that race is still very much with us in the United States. Uh, in 19, uh, in when Nancy Denton and I wrote American Apartheid in 1993, we uh, developed a concept of hypersegregation, a very intense kind of segregation that not only produces uneven distributions of blacks and whites across neighborhoods, but produces l large all-black neighborhoods that are crunched together in space at high levels of density and located in towards the center of the metropolitan area where the oldest housing stock is. And Philadelphia was one of the hypersegregated metropolitan areas. And still today, uh, we've just completed a, a, an update that is published in demography online and will be soon out in print on the recent trends in hypersegregation going from 1970 to 2010, where we discover that uh, about a third of all urban African Americans continue to live under conditions of hypersegregation. And Philadelphia is one of them. So this is the level of segregation measured by the index of dissimilarity and the level of spatial isolation measured by the P-star isolation index. The index of dissimilarity gives the share of blacks and whites that would have to change neighborhoods to achieve an even distribution. That's the blue line on top. And the red line is the percentage black in the neighborhood of the average black person in Philadelphia, metropolitan area, not the city, metropolitan area. So you see that it started high in 1970, and it has really changed very little over time. There's very little indication of much downward movement, much of a shift towards integration. As of 2010, the average African American lived in a neighborhood that was about 62% black, and the dissimilarity index was 72. Those are very high levels that uh, have only really characterized African Americans in the history of the United States. This is, looks at racial and class isolation of the poor African Americans in Philadelphia. So you see if you're very poor and, 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 and black in Philadelphia, you have a very high level of racial isolation of 75, uh, uh, with a score of 75. So the average poor African American lives in a neighborhood that's about 75% black. If you were to throw Latinos in, the percent minority would go further upward. And class isolation, if you look to 2010, what that means is that the average um, poor African American lives in a neighborhood that is 40% poor by federal standards, which is, a, which is an extremely high concentration of poverty. So concentrated poverty, spatial isolation, indeed hypersegregation, continue to characterize the Philadelphia metropolitan area. This looks at Latinos. Uh, and you see there was some movement in the, in the 70s and 80s, but that's flattened out. And levels of Latino segregation really haven't changed much in, in uh, the past 30 years, uh, about with a segregation index, a dissimilarity index of about 60, and uh, an isolation index of about 30. But again, if you put them with blacks, the isolation index goes up to the 80 or 90 mark. So Latinos and African Americans in Philadelphia are quite isolated in minority neighborhoods with high concentrations of poverty. These are the concentrations of, of class isolation and racial isolation for poor Latinos in the metropolitan area, both converging at around 40. So the conditions that we described as of uh, the, the American apartheid was mainly based on the 1980 census. A lot has happened since then, but the conditions that we described uh, for a number of cities uh, back then continue to hold in Philadelphia today with high levels of segregation, high concentrations of poverty, a high degree of isolation, especially for poor Latinos and poor African Americans within Philadelphia, whether you look at racial isolation or class isolation. <clears throat> So what I, I'm usually um, famous for giving really a bummer, downer talks with sad endings, but tonight I have a, a happy ending. It could be happier, uh, and whether it can be happier or not depends on the future. It's a, a book that uh, I co-authored with uh, uh, several students and postdocs uh, and colleagues to study uh, what happened in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, when an 100% affordable, affordable 
project of 140 units was built in the affluent white suburb of Mount Laurel. Uh, what happened to the community in terms of the fears that were expressed beforehand about rising taxes, rising crime rates, and falling property values? And what happened to the people, the people who got to be residents in this project and moved from a disadvantaged neighborhood into one of the more advantaged neighborhoods in the Philadelphia metropolitan area? <clears throat> Mount Laurel is a long story. It goes back to 1967. Even I was young then. <laughs> in 1967, the Springville Community Action Committee was formed. If you know your history, the Community Action Committees were products of Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, designed to empower poor people to help them lift themselves up. And in 1968, the Springville Community Action Committee optioned a 32-acre parcel in Springville, which is a section of Mount Laurel, uh, to develop 36 garden apartments for residents. Uh, the organizers were longtime residents of Mount Laurel, New Jersey, who were African American, who were living in substandard housing, and were finding themselves priced out of the housing market as Mount Laurel shifted from being a farm town to being a bedroom community of Philadelphia. It's a very old black community. It was a stop on the Underground Railroad. It's an old Quaker town. And these are people whose family lines in Mount Laurel go back generations. So um, in 1970, the, the township officials rejected Springville's uh, request for zoning variants to build the garden apartments. The 1971, uh, in 1971, they filed an initial complaint, teaming up with the NAACP, to sue Mount Laurel in court. The alleged Reason was that they didn't allow multi-unit housing, it violated their density regulations, but of course they had given variances to luxury uh, multi-unit housing projects within the township. Uh, in 1975, the New Jersey Supreme Court issued Mount Laurel I um, and uh, ordered uh, the plaintiffs to return to trial court, uh, ordered um, uh, what's called a builder's remedy where builders would be able to sue local townships for the right to build, and then the courts would approve it. Um, but everybody drug their feet and drug their feet. In 1977, the plaintiffs returned to the trial to challenge Mount Laurel Township's compliance. In 1983, New Jersey Supreme Court issued Mount Laurel II, um, which basically not only established that uh, it was against the law of the state, a law of the land of New Jersey, to write zoning regulations such that it would be impossible to build affordable housing, but moreover, that every municipality in the state of New Jersey had an affirmative obligation to provide for its fair share of the regional need for affirmative, for affordable housing. So that it was trying to force communities to open up and allow affordable housing to be built in places where it had largely been excluded. In 1985, in response to the court decision, the New Jersey, the New Jersey um, Fair Housing Act passed by the legislature to create a New Jersey Council on Affordable Housing, COA, and 1985, a final consent order established Mount Laurel Township's fair share of affordable housing units, uh, housing at 980 units. And in 1986, the New Jersey Supreme Court ruled that New Jersey's Fair Housing Act and the COA and the allocation of 980 units to Mount Laurel was, uh, uh, was uh, approved by the Supreme Court. So um, it, there's a little irony here. Um, you have. Um, long-standing community members of Mount Laurel uh, wanting to build 32 apartments and they can't abide poor black people from the community trying to stay in their hometown and so they go to court and they do everything they possible to prevent 32 little, uh, uh, 36 garden apartments from being built uh, and as a result, the entire state of New Jersey now has an affirmative mandate requiring all municipalities to uh, uh, allow for affordable housing. And their affordable share is not 36 units, but 980 units. I like ironies. <laughs> so you'd think in 1986 things were all set. In 1986, Fair Share Housing Development Inc. was selected as the developer. Uh, and by 1986, uh, uh, they acquired three parcels of land in Mount Laurel and began to raise funds towards the cost of housing. They developed plans from 1995 to 1996, and in 1996 they submit plans for the project to the Township Planning Board, which by then, of course, is under court order. They can't really reject them. 
and, but this didn't prevent tempestuous public hearings and township planning board issue, uh, ended up issuing a unanimous approval for the construction of the project. By the time the final project was approved, the lead plaintiff in the case, Ethel Lawrence, had of course died. And so the projects were going to be named in her honor, the Eth Ethel Lawrence Homes in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. The same thing happened in Chicago to Dorothy Gautreau. It dragged through the courts for so long that the Gautreau program that de sought to desegregate public housing in Chicago was named after her, but she never lived long enough to see it. In these tempestuous hearings, the holy trinity of neighborhood concerns were property values, crime, and taxes. And these are quotes. I would like to stay in Mount Laurel and continue to live at my present address without the fear that my property values are going to deteriorate. My concern is the impact this will have on the community as a whole. Have we talked to the police department? I don't feel that we should pay taxes that they will not pay, nor do we have to pay their sewer and water on all the streets. I think that's a big consideration the township has to take into account. Race was an underlying criterion, of course, since most of the low-income people who were expected to move in to the development would be minorities. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, one point a uh, person referred to why we want to build, build a ghetto in the field in Mount Mar Mar Laurel, New Jersey. <clears throat> it made uh, uh, regional nat and national news, as you can see from these articles from the New York Times. Um, and the road to completion um, begins in 1994 when Ethel Lawrence dies and the project's named in her honor. By 2004, financing is finally secured for the Ethel Lawrence homes. Uh, by 1998, the initial financing is secured. In 1999, construction of Ethel Lawrence homes began. In 2000, construction was completed on phase one, 100 units. In 2004, uh, construction was completed on phase two, 40 additional units. So we, they built 40, 140 units in the Ethel Lawrence homes. <clears throat> what is an affordable housing uh, you, uh, uh, development in New Jersey? Well, in this particular one, it's 100% affordable. All the units are affordable, ranging from 10% of the median regional income to 80% of the regional mean, median income. So that's basically an income of $7,300 to about $59,000, or in terms of rent from about $600 to $1,500 in rent. They designed a nice project. It was explicitly designed with the failures of public housing in the United States in mind. Uh, Public housing in the United States uh, was erected following modernist principles, and then the modernist principles, which said that less was more, they subtracted from the less to even produce lesser. Lesser is not more better, it's worser. <laughs> and um, they deteriorated very quickly. There was never enough in the budget to maintain them, the physical plant of the uh, housing projects. They were high-rise, high-density projects. Uh, they tore down black neighborhoods and built these. Uh, you can see some of them still west of Philadelphia, west Philadelphia here. Uh, and um, it not only maintained the color line and perpetuated segregation in cities like Philadelphia and Chicago, it did something else. It drove up the concentration of poverty to levels that had never been seen before in U.S. cities. So you tore down a black neighborhood that was mixed. It had a high poverty rate, maybe 30% to 40%, but you built a project with a poverty rate of 90 or 95%, and you put people in a high-rise tower, families, and then you had spaces for kids to play, but there's no way parents in the 20th floor could supervise their kids at play down on the ground. So it came to be a social and economic disaster. And they sought explicitly to avoid this sort of thing by designing a housing development that would match the suburban ethos, that would be consistent with the architecture in and around the site. So they were designed as a set of, uh, um, uh, of uh, townhouse developments uh, which one is the affordable development? It's the one in the upper left-hand corner. The only way you can really tell is because there's a little more stonework down below. Down below is right across the street in an age-restricted uh, uh, townhouse development for elderly people. And the one uh, right across the other side of the street is uh, the Ethel Lawrence Homes. As you can see, it's well landscaped. It's nice. It's built on cul-de-sacs. It was designed not to attract attention and scream out, here's affordable housing and these people are poor. It was designed to let them blend into the community and then live their lives uh, at peace. <clears throat> so, we, um, when I, 
I was a graduate student at Princeton from 1975 to 1978, and I was following the early days of Mount Laurel. And then I returned to Princeton as a faculty member in 2003, and I learned that the Mount Laurel project had just been built in 2000. <laughs> and so I thought, well, this, this offers an opportunity to do a little study. Uh, so, uh, and so I contacted Fair Share Housing and got their cooperation very readily, and they agreed to turn over all their files to us. And so they hand out their um, uh, rental units, they're all rental, on a first come, first serve basis. And you have to go in in person and, and deposit a, a, an application. And they have a thousand people standing online on the first day when the office opens. Uh, so we have everything from all the application forms that were filed. And what we decided to do was um, use this as a way to study neighborhood effects and to study the effect of affordable housing developments on the surrounding community. And I'll come back to how we did that in a bit. Right now, um, I'm going to focus on the effect of the project on the community. And here, we're in the Campbell-Stanley notation doing a multiple control group time series experiment, where the top you see, you have uh, Mount Laurel Township. And you go along in Mount Laurel, and then the X means then they build the housing development and move people in. And then you have a bunch of observations afterwards. And we're going to focus on taxes, crime rates, and property values. Um, if you see a big break there and crime rates rise, it could be evidence for uh, the negative effects that many residents postulated. But of course, it, that could have been a general rise in crime rate. So you have control comparison groups. So you have other townships nearby that are much like uh, Mount Laurel but didn't get an affordable housing family project. And so we picked um, the three uh, townships nearby, Evesham, Cherry Hill, and Cinnaminson. You probably hear these on... Uh, on the traffic radio in the morning, um, which are all outside of Camden. And of course, you know that Philadelphia is right across the river from Camden. Uh, and and uh, we uh, compared them and found them to be very similar in a variety of different ways. And so we just um, do a simple um, plot to look and see what the trends are uh, with respect, in this case, to crime rates. So um, the big fat um, black line is Mount Laurel. The thin black line is New Jersey State, and the other lines are the townships, the comparison townships. So that you can see that crime rates were going down. This was a nationwide trend. I know the police chiefs in New York and Los Angeles take credit for it, but it happened in places where there wasn't broken windows. It was a general trend, uh, and, and criminologists are still arguing about exactly what was going on, but the un undisputed fact is that crime rates started going down after their highs in the 1980s and can continued down to very low levels. And that's what you observe in all, all the comparisons we're looking at here. And you can eyeball this and kind of get the idea that that's what happened. There's certainly nothing to indicate that crime rates rose in Mount Laurel, the thick black line, after, after uh, the project was opened. Um, but we can do a statistical test, uh, difference in difference test, to show that the slopes um, before and after uh, are no different between the experimental uh, group that is Mount Laurel and the comparison townships. So you can, you can see it with your own eyes but you can also do a fancy statistical test to show it statistically. <clears throat> this is trends in property values in Mount Laurel and the three comparison townships. Uh, the uh, the uh, dark line again is Mount Laurel, then Evesham, Cherry Hill, and Cinnaminson. See the property values were rising after the year 2000. This was the housing boom. And the housing boom uh, wrote, brought up all the boats uh, after the project was built. There's certainly no indicator that the pace of change was any different in, in Mount Laurel. It was always below the others a little bit. Uh, and then uh, in 2006, it began to flatten out. And then when the housing crisis hit in 2008, Mount Laurel and several of the townships went down. But the dash line at the very top, uh, Cinnaminshin Township, took a bigger hit than even uh, than Mount Laurel. So the, again, difference in difference tests suggest there's no effect of the opening of the development on um, um, property, uh, property values. And we also did a difference in difference test in the two immediately adjacent neighborhoods to the project itself. And again, we found no compelling evidence for an effect on property values. It was mainly driven by the macro real estate market that was booming and then collapsed in the late 2000s. So, we conclude 
that um, it, uh, fair share housing proved that it's possible to build a 100% affordable housing development, put it in an affluent white suburb, populate it with low-income people, all of whom are below, well below the median income for the area, and incidentally, 45% are black and 45% are Latino and about 10% are white. Uh, you can build this project, populate it, and there's no negative externalities on crime rates, property values, or taxes. <clears throat> um, so now we do um, what's called a match control group comparison. So here we have uh, um, observations before people move into Mount Laurel, the Ethel Lawrence homes, and then they move into Mount Laurel, that's the X, then afterwards. And then we have people who uh, are measured at the same time before and the same time afterward, but they don't move into Mount Laurel. And, and the R is random, but we have a line through it. It's not random. Um, where what we do is compare people who are in the projects or who have been in the project, about 10% of the people moved on, and we tracked them down and interviewed them, um, uh, and compared them with people who are on the waiting list, who had applied, self-selected into the population of people who want to live in this kind of affordable housing, but uh, had not yet advanced up to uh, be able to be in the gain entry. And we have all the information from all the applications so we can do matched comparisons, which I'll come to. So what we did was um, we conducted a survey of current and former residents of Ethel Lawrence Homes, and, and then we tried to track down as many um, um, non-residents, people that uh, had applied uh, but were, um, uh, had not yet or not gotten in, uh, and uh, we got a really good response rate from uh, residents, about 65, uh, uh, let's see, where is it? All residents, about 76%. Uh, Non-residents was a much lower, and the biggest reason was we couldn't find them because poor people move a lot, and uh, we just couldn't track people down. The refusal rate was actually fairly low. <clears throat> so this is kind of the basic data, what you find. Uh, so you have non-residents, and this is exposure to violence and disorder in the neighborhoods. So we asked them, fortunately the move was in 2000, so we asked them, think about where you were in 1999 and tell us about the neighborhood where you lived. How often did you see police cars, hear police sirens, uh, see uh, uh, gang graffiti, see um, people getting mugged, hear gunshots, all these sorts of things. And then, they, and then we had them report on where they are now. And for the Mount Laurel people, where they are now is in Mount Laurel. And then for the others, it's where they were when we they were on the list. So you can see that uh, disorder and violence was going down, we knew that, but it went down much faster for residents than non-residents. So people who were lucky enough to make the move out of Camden, for example, into the Ethel Lawrence Homes in Mount Laurel had a huge reduction in exposure to violence and disorder in their neighborhoods. The violence and disorder was going down in general, but there was a big effect of being able to move into uh, Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Um, and so um, what we do, the, the, this is all the information we have uh, for the, um, from the uh, application form. And position on the waiting list is critical because that indicates how motivated they are to, to, um, to uh, get access to the housing. Uh, so you see mean values to the left, including some tracked indicators where their neighborhood was. And to the right is a model we estimated to ge generate propensity scores. So we matched uh, people who were in the project with the closest propensity score, the probability of getting in the project given that they weren't in the project yet, and matched them. And um, basically all the rest of the tests I'm going to show you are basically in this form. We have just a simple unmatched comparison where you just look at the raw effect of moving into the Ethel Lawrence homes. The second one is unmatched but with all the control variables put in, uh, including the propensity score as a control variable. And the third one is a propensity score matched comparison. And um, I'm going to switch to graphic form. So here's, this is just the information from that equation, looking at the effect of Ethel Lawrence residents on exposure to disorder violence within neighborhoods. So you see that just overall, just a mean difference, uh, um, a big increase in, in, the, we, in our index of disorder and crime. And this is severity weighted. We use the uh, Wolfgang Selen severity, crime severity index to weight different uh, um, delinquent acts differently. 
So it's a very weighted. So if you see somebody get stabbed, that's a lot worse than seeing graffiti on the wall. Um, and you see, no matter how we cut it, there's a massive decline in exposure to disorder and violence. And this is not rocket science. Um, they moved from Camden and Trenton into Mount Laurel. Uh, and Mount Laurel is a very safe, low crime, secure area. So uh, they experienced an immediate benefit in lower exposure to crime and violence and social disorder. Associated with the lower exposure to disorder was a lower exposure to negative life events. So we asked them, you know, in, in your household, in your people that live in your household, um, in the last year, um, uh, has anyone been um, uh, mugged? Has your place been burgled? Uh, have, uh, has graffiti been sprayed on your house? Uh, have somebody gotten pregnant? Has somebody lost their job? Has somebody, all kinds of bad things that can happen to you. And you can see that um, there's been, uh, uh, as a result of the move, for what we can see, there's a big drop in exposure to negative life events. Again, this is not rocket science. They moved out of a real delinquent neighborhood with a lot of bad things can happen to you into a very safe one where it's very rare that really bad things happen to people. <clears throat> and this is associated, in turn, with a much lower level of mental distress. So we asked about symptoms. Uh, we had a standard anxiety survey form on there and basically found that levels of, of anxiety, mental distress, went down. And the longer they were in the project, the less their mental distress symptoms were. Um, so basically, that replicates the famous MTO study, a moving to opportunity study. They found that moving to opportunity um, uh, randomly assigned people to receive housing vouchers that they could take and move to a low poverty area or not, uh, and some didn't receive anything. Uh, and uh, uh, the people who moved to low poverty area did indeed experience lower levels of poverty and lower exposure to violence and disorder and better mental health. But that's all they experienced. Uh, and um, the reason is that, uh, the, first of all, only half the people who were offered vouchers to move into a nice neighborhood used it, so you had a selective selection out of the pool of the treated. Uh, then of those who receive the voucher and actually use it to move from a higher to a low poverty neighborhood, 90% simply move to another black neighborhood in the existing ghetto, just from a relatively higher to a relatively lower poverty neighborhood, often within the same, almost always within the same school district, usually within the same school catchment area. So they really, and really didn't change their spatial position in urban society very markedly. So what we're looking at here as a better test of neighborhood effects is a quantum leap in quality of neighborhoods from places like Camden and Trenton to, to places like uh, Mount Laurel, New Jersey. And when we do this, we look at residents and non-residents, we find the indicators of, of uh, economic independence, there's always a big increase. There's a big increase in the percent working for pay, big increase in income from work, big increase in total income, big, big increase in the uh, percentage of income from work. And from this, we use a factor scale to create an index of economic independence and use that. And in each of the different treatment conditions, the test conditions, we found a big, significant increase in economic independence as a result of being able to move into Mount Laurel. And the longer they're there, the more independent they get. So this summarizes what we've got. Now, remember, we've only got 140 uh, units. We've got, an we've got, I think, about 132 interviews with residents and a roughly similar number of non-residents. We don't have a lot of degrees of freedom. We don't have a lot of power here. So this is probably underestimating a lot some of the relationships, but nonetheless, these are the significant relationships we get. And this basically summarizes what we found in a simple path model. People move into Ethel Lawrence, and compared to the control group, they experience lower exposure to neighborhood disorder and violence, which in turn um, reduces their frequency of negative life events. And both exposure to neighborhood disorder and violence and frequency of negative life events both contribute to reduced mental, uh, mental uh, distress. And then Ethel Lawrence residents, by, because they're exposed to fewer negative life events, they actually make better employees. They're not worried about coming home at night. They're not stressed out. They don't have to take off work because they're, they're um, 
their son got mugged or expelled from school or something. And then there's a direct effect of simply moving in to a high uh, income, high job area like Mount Laurel, New Jersey, which is surrounded by office parks, shopping malls, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, strip malls, and so on. There are lots of jobs in the area. So unlike MTO, we find big effects and strong effects on economic independence. Now we turn our gaze to the kids. What happened to the kids? And they moved out of crowded row houses in sometimes North Philadelphia, sometimes uh, Camden, sometimes Trenton, um, and into a nice townhouse. And most of the kids got their own bedroom. And so you see there's a big effect on their getting, having a quiet place to study. Kids have a quiet place to study. And in fact, there's a little rec center right as part of the thing where they have a homework club. It's an after school club where kids go. So um, they get access to a quiet place to study. Uh, their parents, because um, they're in a school district where teachers actually care what parents think, uh, they communicate regularly with the teachers, they go to PTA meetings, they go to parent-teacher conferences, they take their kids to the aquarium, they take their kids to uh, the museums, they're much more involved in what a um, economists might call human capital cultivation. So this is an index we created on the effect of ELI uh, at the Lawrence residence on measures of parental support for cultural enrichment and education. And you can see the parents are doing a lot more. And the longer they're there, the more they do for their kids. <clears throat> and this is a huge effect, looking at the effect of moving into <coughs> Lawrence on hours studied per week. Um, our strongest estimates show that it's about six hours additional study time per week as a result of moving out of their uh, crappy neighborhood into the advantaged setting of the Ethel Lawrence homes in Mount Laurel. And the longer they're there, the more they study. <clears throat> this is also not surprising. They got access to much higher quality schools. On any, these are all indicators. We found out where the kids in each unit were going, and then we went to the schools and we got state data on the quality of uh, different indicators of school quality and created a school quality index using factor methods. And as you can see, there's a big difference in quality of schools between residents and non-residents. The residents move into one of New Jersey's best school districts. Usually they're coming out from one of New Jersey's worst school districts. Camden, I believe, is the worst school district in uh, New Jersey. <clears throat> and so we find a big effect on school quality. And it drops a little bit with some of the controls, but it, it's robustly significant no matter how we do it. And again, this is not rocket science. They moved into a good school district from a bad school district. And this, again, shows what happens when you change the circumstances rather than moving from one poor, uh, one very poor black area to one less poor black area in the same school catchment area, when you change from one well -resourced school, uh, poorly resourced school district to well resourced school district, you have a big difference in, 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 in treatment. And then we had a bunch of indices about indicators of disorder, minor to major, uh, and we created an index. And uh, again, within the school, we found a dramatic reduction in exposure to disorder and violence within schools. So they're much more safe, secure places to learn. And, and uh, the latest research coming out of Rob Sampson's um, project in Chicago and, um, uh, and other longitudinal surveys that have been done, detailed neighborhood-based surveys, show that exposure to violence has significant cognitive effects that have continuing effects over time. Uh, Pat Sharkey, in his study, showed that exposure to uh, a homicide uh, had a short-term effect in pushing down uh, achievement scores. And uh, Sharkey and, um, and Samson, in an article in Science, showed that there were long-term cognitive impairments for long-term exposure to disorder and violence. So not only do the kids not experience disorder and violence uh, in the neighborhood, they don't experience it in the school either. And uh, between the higher quality education with more caring teacher, many more resources, much more parental involvement, and uh, lower exposure to disorder and violence, they do quite well in school. So again, we probably would have found more significant connections, but we, the, the degrees of freedom is even smaller because not all the families have kids. So um, what we have here is what we could estimate with our data by moving into Ethel Lawrence Homes, 
they end up with more hours studied, more supportive parental behavior, and they get a quiet place to study, higher school quality, lower levels of disorder and violence, and uh, all these things act, if you follow the paths and multiply, uh, act to uh, raise their grade point. Notice that the direct effect is negative. And this is what you would expect. They're moving from a very uncompetitive school district into a very competitive school district. So other things equal, if you just threw them, took them and threw them from one environment to the other, they'd probably get lower grades. But other things aren't equal. They study a lot more, they have a quiet place to study, they have higher quality schools, and they have much less exposure to disorder and violence. And those things offset, so the net effect is actually zero. So they earn the same grades they would have earned had they gone to the poor school, but now they're going to a much, much higher quality school. And finally, um, just a note on how this whole operation was funded. It was funded, um, half of it was funded by the Federal Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, uh, light C in the trade. Uh, and um, this is a Reagan era proposal from the 1986 Reagan tax cut. Uh, so thank you, Ron Reagan, for um, <laughs> helping to build affordable housing. Uh, and, and most of the rest was another 34% uh, was a loan from the state of New Jersey, a fair share of housing development put in their own capital, private sectors make some uh, investments, and um, the, uh, a federal bank loan from New York. So it was mainly financed through tax credits and lending. Uh, and so therefore a low marginal effect on the taxpayers of New Jersey in general. So my conclusions. Um, it's possible to build affordable housing in an affluent suburb without <coughs> negative externalities for the host, to com host community. And in this case, we found no effect on taxes, property values, or crime rates, despite the dire predictions of critics of the project before the fact. For adults, access to affordable housing in an affluent suburb reduces exposure to disorder and violence, lowers the frequency of negative life events, improves mental health, uh, and I didn't show this, but it does not reduce social support. We have a whole, we had a whole, in the book, we have a whole series of uh, indicators of how frequently they interact with their family members and their neighbors. And in fact, the family members don't change. But what changes with neighbors, they actually interact more with their neighbors now because they have some measure of trust in this, in this development. And so the, they actually get more social capital. They feel comfortable asking their neighbor to watch their kids while they go to the the store for an hour or something. So, um, uh, so it, it redu it, there's no loss of social support as a result of this move. In fact, there's probably a gain. And finally, uh, for children, uh, access to affordable housing in an affluent suburb improves learning conditions at home, increases hours of study, improves school quality, reduces exposure to disorder and violence within the schools, and does not reduce great grade achievement. <coughs> And this affordable housing was developed under the Low Income Housing Tax Credit and offers a cost-effective way to promote racial and class integration and promote social mobility of the disadvantaged at low marginal cost to taxpayers in the state of New Jersey. So, and finally, this is quasi-experimental evidence, I think, that neighborhoods do matter. Uh, the problem with the MTO studies is you didn't vary the neighborhood quality very much. When you vary the quality and give them a real difference, it has a profound effect. And what we saw was basically the move enabled these people who are hardworking, <coughs> low-income people to get a platform from which to stably pursue their economic interests. And they moved up quite rapidly towards economic independence, lower rates of welfare usage, higher earnings, uh, and improved circumstances. So our basic conclusion is that it's a win-win-win situation for everyone. It's a win for the residents who get to dramatically improve their living circumstances and launch themselves on a path of upward mobility. It's a win for the people of Mount Laurel, New Jersey, because they get to diversify their community without paying any ne negative externalities. They didn't suffer any increase in property value, decrease in property values, or taxes, tax burdens, or crime rates. Uh, so it was a win for them as well. And finally, it's a win for the uh, citizens of the great state of New Jersey because it shows that you can develop a project at low marginal cost using federal subsidies that are made available outside the state and, and produce um, uh, residential integration without uh, burdening the taxpayers of New Jersey. Indeed, on the contrary, you take a bunch of people who were heavily dependent on social services and turn them into independent economic actors who do not use welfare but rather pay taxes. 
So naturally, since it's a win-win-win for everyone in New Jersey, Governor Chris Christie is dead set against it and has done everything in his power to uh, upend and prevent uh, the Mount Laurel doctrine from prevailing in New Jersey. Uh, fortunately, on March 11th, a few weeks ago, uh, the Supreme Court handed down a unanimous decision that told Chris Christie he couldn't do that anymore and that he had to start freeing up the monies that had been sequestered for low-income housing development and, he, and, uh, he, uh, they, uh, they, and the Supreme Court abandoned the Council on Affordable Housing exit out, and now they're going back to the original mechanism for enforcement, which was what were called builder's rem remedies. So developers are authorized to sue townships for the right to build affordable housing units in the townships. So they can build uh, 200 units of affordable housing, uh, of, of, of market, of housing, as long as they make 15% market rate, that qualifies under Mount Laurel. And so they have an economic incentive to push. And they have land waiting to go. They purchase land that's ready to go. They just need the townships to start, municipalities to start granting the, uh, the zoning um, permission to do it. And, and the courts at this point are furious with, with the politicians and with Christie administration. And they're going to put, the, uh, put nails in, into the coffin of Christie's plans to scuttle uh, affordable housing in the state. So we'll see how that all works out. That's all in the future. I was just talking about Mount Laurel at, at the Seton Hall Law School the other day, and the consensus for the housing experts there was that things are finally moving forward on the right track. Uh, only uh, uh, 40 years after uh, Ethel Lawrence filed her suit and 20 years after she died, uh, finally um, things may be moving forward at a more rapid pace in New Jersey. And I think the evidence shows that this, these, these housing mobility programs, have real potential for lowering levels of segregation by race and class uh, in the state of New Jersey. And uh, if they were more widely used, would help to desegregate what is one of the most segregated states in the Union. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. <laughs>